So uh, these talks are not mandatory. And I'm probably not going to give a talk every day, but for, uh, for the first part of the course, and near the end, I'll expect uh, most people will be in intensive practice. But uh, I also do a lot of talking individually, so if you have something, uh, you're welcome to ask questions, of course, during reporting, that's for sure. But if you have a question that's a little more broad, maybe not explicitly about your practice, you can, uh, if you want, you can write down questions and leave them with uh, Jeff and Adder, and I can answer them in, in, in a group if you'd rather I answer them uh, anonymously and to the, address them to the group. This isn't an invitation to ask me about things unrelated to the practice. They should still have relevance to our course. But if there's something in particular about the course, you're welcome to suggest or, or something you're interested about, you'd like me to talk at length. But I do have several things to talk about, so today, as I said, we'll begin by talking about mindfulness. So starting with mindfulness is for the purpose of just providing a little more clarity, not maybe telling you things you already know, but just a reminder about what it is that we are to be using as our main tool or weapon during this course, because it's easy to get off track and uh, develop bad habits if you start uh, diversifying your skill set, like applying different techniques outside of mindfulness. Right? We can develop bad habits if we forget that to be mindful. So always remember that really the only tool that you should be concerned with is mindfulness. So the first thing to talk about is maybe a reminder, but for some of you maybe new information about what mindfulness actually is. As I've said, uh, the word mindfulness isn't a great translation. It's not a literal translation, anyway. Sati means the ability to remember, or the faculty of remembrance. So someone who is able to remember things that happened a long time ago has a lot of, has good mindfulness, strong mindfulness. So, it's a curious definition and it's a curious word to use because that has nothing to do with what we're doing here. But that faculty of being able to remember is meant to refer to our capacity to keep something in mind. Because mindfulness has the quality of keeping an object in mind. It's like grasping the object rightly, firmly. Something to keep in mind. Uh, keep, keep in mind in the way we say it in English that um, mindfulness is a more literal keeping in mind. So I often talk to you about um, not reacting to your experiences, uh, not, not diversifying your experiences, not making more out of your experiences that they, than they are. Those are the sorts of things that we mean when we talk about mindfulness. 
That, that's a sort of a brief explanation of why we use the word sati, which doesn't mean mindfulness, it means remembrance or the ability to remember or something like that. But more explicitly or more, uh, more detailed, we have what is called the Lakan Adi Chatuka, which is just a fa fancy Pali word for a fourfold defining of something. So rather than just giving you a bunch of words that are the definition of it, I'm giving you some explanation of what it means, they go deeper than that and say, of all the Dhammas, they try to take every Dhamma, every mental quality, every reality, and identify four factors, starting with the Lakana. Lakana di Chattuka means the fourfold factor, starting with the Lakana. So, if we look at the Lakana di Chattuka of Sati, which just means, you know, the, the, the commentarial definition of Sati, it gives us some interesting insight into why this word, what this word means. And it helps us get a sense of at least how the ancient teachers that followed after the Buddha, how they viewed mindfulness, how they, they viewed this word. Uh, you'll see, I think it's quite useful to help you pinpoint exactly what it is you're doing here. So the four qualities are, are, the, are the four aspects are the lakana, the, the characteristic, the function, the manifestation, and the proximate cause. So the characteristic of sati, and this relates to what I was saying about not wavering, the characteristic of sati is the not wavering, the, the, the characteristic of a mind that doesn't waver, that doesn't flit here and flit there, that doesn't, um, in Thai they say, doesn't float. Because the, the, the analogy is of a gourd or an, an empty pumpkin floating on the, the ocean. A gourd will float on the water, and if the wind is blowing, it certainly won't stay put. A mind that is unmindful uh, floats, it drifts, is the word. The mind drifts here and drifts there according to the wind. So you can see how your mind does this normally. The mind experiences something, but doesn't stay with it. So we might say it doesn't remember, it doesn't... Uh, it, it forgets the object. Like when you say to someone, you forget yourself. What we're saying is that you've lost sight of your situation. Right? Like if, ser if a servant starts spouting off to the boss or something, like, uh, uh, or a, an employee starts mouthing off to the boss, you might say, you forget yourself. And it's quite possible they did. They forgot, oh yeah, I can't say this to my boss. In the same way, on an experiential level, we forget what it is we're experiencing in favor of some reaction, in favor of some extrapolation, some narrative, some uh, mental proliferation. So our mind wanders, drifts. A mind that doesn't do that is a mind that is uh, mindful. So the characteristic of mindfulness is not drifting. And the analogy or the simile is a, uh, a post, a cement uh, pillar stuck in the bottom of the bottom of the lake. Even though the wind blows, the, the the pillar is the opposite of the pumpkin. It's not going to float here. It's not going to float there. It's going to stay put. So when your mind is fixed on the object, this is why I said like grasping the object. When your mind is able to grasp 
It's like you, just, you feel pain and the mind that is able to grasp the pain for pain without any reaction, that's the mindful one. So that's sort of like the, the quality that we're looking for as a result of our practice. Remember, I've, I've said to some of you, um, the practice that we're doing is not actually mindfulness, it evokes mindfulness. So the quality that comes from, for example, saying to yourself, pain, pain, the quality is the quality of sticking with things. You're training your mind, you're teaching your mind, you're reminding your mind to stay with the object. That pain is just pain, to not get lost in what you think it is or So that's the characteristic that it's working, is that you are able to stick with an object. And it's not one object, it's whatever object, even if you're distracted. To be aware of the distraction as distraction is still mindful. It's when you stop uh, continuing or diversifying it, where distraction is just distraction and pain is just pain. That's the characteristic. The function of mindfulness is not forgetting. So nothing new here. This is just sort of similar to the similar to the the, the characteristic. But it, the function is more like, well, what's it for? It's for not forgetting. It's so that you don't get lost. So that you don't forget yourself. The ability to uh, experience something just as it is. But the manifestation, manifestation is quite interesting, the twofold manifestation. One, it has the manifestation of guarding. So some of the discourses talk about mindfulness as being like a, a guard at the city gate. Now the guard at the city gate doesn't prevent people from entering, but the guard at the city gate stops problem people from entering, or stops entering, or stops problems from entering, stops the enemies, makes sure that there's no trouble, that troublemakers aren't coming into the city. And so mindfulness is like a filter in some ways, like this guard that stands at the gate and lets people pass, but makes sure that it's only the people doing legal business, right? The thieves aren't coming in, uh, the wild animals aren't coming in. But with the mind, it, the, it's the hindrances or the defilements. Because our mind, the experiences that we have are not defiled. Just because you have a thought about something bad that happened in the past doesn't mean you have a problem. The thought is just an experience. If you have a thought about something that's in the future, maybe a, a, a deadline or an exam or something like that, the thought itself isn't a problem. You can let it go in. But what follows it in is the anxiety and the trauma and the uh, reactions to it. And that's what the mindfulness keeps out. So mindfulness doesn't stop thoughts from coming. It doesn't stop your pain. When you say pain, pain, it doesn't prevent the pain. Pain can go through. But the disliking of the pain, that's what we've got to keep out. Keep it out of the city of our mind. And the other uh, manifestation that is also an important part of how it manifests itself, is as confronting our experiences. So I've talked about this before. Confronting is kind of a, yeah, you, the word confronting probably isn't exact, but it's probably, I think it's as close as facing actually. Facing is a better one, almost literal translation. Facing your experiences head on, you might say. So not quite confronting in an in in antagonistic way, but facing in a strong and, and unshaken way. 
it's kind of special in that our ordinary way of dealing with things is usually to fight or flight, right? It might be a little simplistic to say fight or flight, but fix, right? Um, solve, as though it's a problem. Our experience we see as problems, and so we try to fix them. And it's those attitudes of trying to fix, trying to change, or prevent from changing that cause, cause our stress and suffering. So mindfulness is a third option or an alternative option. It's, it's kind of the absence of any action. Mindfulness is like, Jeff, what are you going to do about it? You're going to say, I'm not going to do anything about it. Mindfulness is not taking action, in a sense, but maybe more accurately is saying rather than seeing problems that we have to solve, we should try and see experiences that we should try to understand. So I've said this before, that our ordinary way of looking at things is as problems that need a solution, problems and the action is to solve them. With mindfulness, the difference is they are experiences to be not exactly understood in the English sense. It's a special special usage of the word understanding because it's not intellectual. More like becoming familiar with. Or in a sense, not forgetting. It's not even that there is some deep truth that we have to understand about things. It's that we have to let go of all of our ignorance about it, all of our misunderstanding about it. That seeing is just seeing. The pain is just pain. So mindfulness manifests itself as this state of mind where you face your experiences, and that's it not face them and talk them down or make them go away or something. It's very much associated with patience. It's a very special kind of patience. Ordinarily we would say patience is where you bear with something you don't like. Or we could even say you like it, but you hold back, right? But mindfulness is special because it's the absence of liking things that are attractive, and the absence of disliking things that are repulsive. It's a state of being with your experience, free from any reactivity, free from any judgment. In a, in a sense, it's the greatest happiness, or it's the, the greatest sort of mind state, the greatest sort of peace that you can find in the world because you're not dependent on your experiences being one way or another way. Only when this goes I will be happy, only when this comes I will be happy. Mindfulness lets you be happy regardless of what you experience. It's the, and, and another quality of facing which makes this so special is how strong it is. Think of how many times in our life we've said to ourselves, I just can't face that. I can't take it. I can't stand it. I can't bear it. I can't wait. You know, so many can't, can't, can't because we're weak. It's not an indictment, it's just a admission. We are weak. And we try to be strong, we find ways to be strong, but that sort of strength is caught up with ego, right? It's caught up with conceit and arrogance and brashness and anger. How are we going to be strong? We're going to just get really angry at the things we don't like. And anger is a weakness. Anger makes you sick. You're not strong because you're angry.
Mindfulness is a special sort of strength that doesn't require you to force things or push or control yourself. It's like the ultimate power. There's a story of the Bodhisattva, and it's about patience, which is a similar sort of thing. But uh, the story goes that this king got very angry at him, all this cut right to the chase. So just summary, summary of it is this king cut off his ears and cut off his uh, nose and his, uh, the king was very, the king accused him of, of uh, stealing away his, his uh, women, his harem or something. And so he, and the, and the Bodhisattva just, he asked the king, he said, what do you think my patience is in my ears? He cut off his hands. Do you think my patience is in my hands? It's a quality of mind that, that makes you invincible. You, know, you can't stop experiences, but you become free from them. You become unaffected by them. It's like the saying in the Mangala Sutta, Putasa Loka Damehi Chittanya Sanakampati. The greatest blessing is when you're touched by good things and bad things, when a person's mind doesn't waver, isn't moved by good or bad, by the pleasant or unpleasant, by the attractive or the repulsive, that's the greatest blessing. Mindfulness gives us this power that you would think is impossible, the power to face anything. So many things we think I could never face that. Mindfulness gives you the power to face it. You don't have to fix it. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't immediately fix your problems. It just helps you see them not as problems. And finally, we come to the proximate cause of sati. And this is interesting, it, it helps often when I'm talking about using the mantra to note. Because I think the mantra often gets a bad rap, usually when it's referred to as noting. And noting just seems like this arbitrary way of practicing meditation. Where did this come from? Because people often don't make the connection between what we do and what, what is you know, probably the most accepted meditation techniques since ancient time, and that's mantra meditation. Somehow we have the idea that wisdom can't come from such a banal thing. Somehow you have to think more or reflect or investigate because we intellectualize everything. But wisdom isn't an intellectual exercise. Wisdom is seen clearly. And mindfulness gives us the capacity to see clearly. But what is it that causes mindfulness? What is it, or what is it that causes sati? What allows us to remember our experiences just as they are, without uh, proliferation? The commentary says it's something called tira sanya. Sanya is a, a word that means well different things, but here it means something like recognition. Sanya is the quality of mind that recognizes something. So our capacity to recognize pain as pain, that's sanya. That's not special. And that's why people say, why do I have to know? I already know that it's pain. Why do I have to remind myself of that? I already know it. Knowing it is sanya. Knowing that this is pain, knowing that this is uh, seeing, knowing that this is thinking, that's sanya. Tira is a word that means strong, founded, uh, established, firm is probably the best translation. So it, it implies a strengthening of the recognition. And the, the, the idea is that when you, when you do something, whatever you do, to strengthen that recognition or to, to reaffirm it, we might say in English. 
right? When you reaffirm the recognition, then your mind doesn't go the next step because sanya is part of it, a sequence. Usually sanya, the recognition, you see someone, an enemy or something, you see them, you recognize they're your enemy, it leads right away to reaction, right? But if you could somehow keep yourself just at the level of sanya, just recognizing it, then you'd free yourself from that next step. You'd, you'd, you'd divert your attention, re re redirect it back to just being aware of it. And that's exactly what a mantra does, no matter what kind of meditation you practice. The mantra is about reminding yourself, about reaffirming the recognition of the experience, that, that bare recognition before going on to sankhara, which would be liking it, disliking it, judging it. So the noting, because it reaffirms that recognition, it creates this state called sati, where the mind remembers the thing, and doesn't forget the thing, doesn't waver. This is the detailed explanation from the commentaries, so it's pretty ancient, about what sati is. And I don't know if you can come up with a better one in the commentaries, but to me it seems quite uh, impressive that they were able to be so precise and give such a good explanation of it. At any rate, I, want, uh, I think the benefit of having explained this is a hopefully some clarity about what we're doing and why we're doing it, why you have to repeat these words to yourself. The other proximate cause, an, an alternative way of talking about the proximate cause of sati, is the four foundations of mindfulness. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is a little bit about the four foundations of mindfulness. I'm not going to take too much time talking a lot already. But I want to address why we have the four foundations of mindfulness and what significance they have. So let's go back a little bit. Um, sati itself, if I was going to address first of all why sati is so important, why would we pick sati over all the many other qualities? We have the Buddha's own words that sati is um, the meaning of mindfulness. And the Buddha said, when you when you are, have always sati, satiya avipavaso apamadoti ruchati. When uh, when you're not without sati ever, that's apamada. Apamada. Apamada means negligence, intoxication, heedlessness. So the Buddha talked about this thing called heedfulness or non-negligence. Apamada has to do with being drunk. So apamada is like being sober. But mainly it means being vigilant, being present, being ardent and alert and so on. And I bring this up because this was the last words of the Buddha. He said, he said, Appamadina Sampadi, that was the last thing he said, that we should strive to fulfill this quality of Appamada, which he had taught as being Sati. So Sati is in so many places in the Tipitaka given as this very central quality of mind that we have to develop. If you look at the bodhjangas, bodhjangas are the seven factors of enlightenment. What the Buddha says about them, six of them have to be balanced. But sati, the Buddha said, satincha koham bhikkhuve sabatikam vadami. I tell you monks, sati is always useful. Of the seven bodhjangas, it is the one you don't have to balance it. You don't have to say, sometimes I need less, sometimes I need more. 
instead of this one, you have to balance with this one. And so. But sati is always useful. So. In so many places, if you read the Satipatthana Sutta. So that's about sati. Sati is rightly taught as central to the Buddha's teaching and to the practice of becoming enlightened. There's no question. But what are the four Satipatthana and where do they come from? Which also helps us understand uh, why sati is so important. If you look at the first discourse of the Buddha, he taught suffering, right? He taught the Four Noble Truths, but they, cent they, they center around this core concept of, of suffering. And what he said about suffering, which is not often appreciated well enough, is that suffering is to be fully understood. I say it's not appreciated well enough because usually when I ask you, what should we do about suffering? What did the Buddha tell us to do? Escape it, right? Find freedom from it. Didn't the Buddha teach freedom from suffering? We miss the part where the Buddha said we should completely understand it. It's the most direct uh, injunction towards action. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to fully understand. Parinyaya. Nyaya should be known pari fully or completely. Pari has this, pari means literally like, like a perimeter in, in English. It means a circle, like all around. And it gives a sense of thoroughly. Thoroughly meaning you have to get right in there and thoroughly understand it. Meaning our, that our whole practice has to be about suffering. Why? Why is this a good thing? Why would we want to do that? So that we don't suffer. So that we don't fall under its prey, under its influence, under its power. All this talk about mindfulness, right? If you face suffering, if you face the things that cause reaction and stress, you can learn and free yourself from those habits of change the relationship you have with suffering. Now why do I bring this up? Because what did the Buddha say was suffering? In brief, the five aggregates. And the five aggregates, for those of you who have studied anything of Buddhism, you should know that they are incredibly central to the Buddha's teaching, right? For this reason, they are, in brief, the truth of suffering. The five aggregates um, can be often misunderstood to, to be like you. You think, oh, you are the five aggregates and you are the five aggregates, but that's not correct. We think of a being as made up of the five aggregates, like here is this aggregate and over here is that aggregate. The aggregates are rightly understood as things that arise together at the six senses. So every time you see, in seeing, there is the five aggregates. The rupa aggregate is the light and the eye. Those are called rupa, they're physical. Vedana, well, at the eye, technically it's a neutral feeling, but you also feel happy about what you see or unhappy, so there's pleasant or painful feeling. But painful feeling is mostly like physically, you, you might feel pain because of the physical experience. But that's Vedana, uh, Sanya, I talked about Sanya, the recognition. What you see, recognizing a man, a woman, a person, a, a dog or so on. Sankara is what you think about it. Sankara is you, you like it or you dislike it or you judge it or you are mindful of it. Those are all Sankara. And Vijnana, the fifth one, is consciousness. Consciousness when you're aware of the fact that you're seeing. So when you see, there's an awareness of seeing, right? That awareness is vijnana. Every time you see, every time you hear, every, every experience you have has these five aggregates in it. That's how they should be understood. Um, but a question is, how do you practice to, to know them thoroughly, right? How are you going to practice towards the five aggregates? Even people who are familiar to them, if you ask them, how do you practice towards the five aggregates? 
they're not very practical in their layout. They weren't meant to be a practice. The Buddha didn't say, practice the five aggregates or something, or even practice knowing the five aggregates. It was his exposition of what exists, which is different. Sometimes the Buddha taught, this is what exists. Sometimes he taught, this is what you should do. And usually what you should do to see what exists, right? So what should you do to see the five aggregates? That's the four foundations of mindfulness. It is. That's, you won't find anything else comparable to the four foundations of mindfulness. It's clear that that's what they are, that's what they're for. There's, you couldn't sit and find anything else that was similar where you said, oh, no, no, this is a better way of learning about the five aggregates. Especially because really the four foundations of mindfulness are the five aggregates, right? Kaya is rupa, vedana is vedana, jitta is vijnana, you might say sankara as well, but let's say vijnana, and dhamma is everything really. I mean, it includes sanya and sankara, but it includes all sorts of stuff, mostly sanya sankara. Especially the hindrances being sankara, right? But the difference is the four foundations of mindfulness are practical. You practice them. It's laid out as a practice, not as a theory of what is or an explanation of what is. It's describing a practice and several practices. So that's the reason for the four foundations of mindfulness. That's, that's what it's for and that's what you're doing. You're learning about the five aggregates. Most importantly, that they're impermanent, suffering, and non-self, because that's what's going to help you see that they're not worth clinging to. It's going to help you get rid of the cause of suffering and attain freedom from suffering. There are other reasons for the four foundations of mindfulness. One question the commentary asks is, why four? Why are there four satipatthana? Why are they laid out like that? It's an interesting question. Maybe nobody thought of it. But it wasn't meant to be something that people were really concerned with. They didn't like the fact that there were four of them, but it is curious that there are four. And it's a good question simply because there's a good answer. There's a couple of good answers, but one of the good answers is they, they fit nicely with the four perversions. And perversion here isn't meant, isn't like homosexuality is a perversion. It's not, I mean, but it's not. But like how people would say something like that, or or, um, I don't know what people say, pornography is a, I mean, it's not um, something that is disgusting or something like that. That's not the, the meaning of perversion here, where some people, where people find certain things perverse, like other religions. I, I, I say that because I sound like maybe, oh, well, maybe he's getting all religious on his perversion. And that's a different kind of perversion. It's just, that, that one is subjective. Certain people find certain things perverse and, and often get very hateful about things like that, right? But perversion here means in a very technical sense. And that's what Buddhism is. Buddhism tries or purports to be scientific. So if we were to say something is perverse, we better have a scientific reason for it being perverse. So by perversion, we mean in Buddhism something that is distorted, something that is a distortion of reality, it goes against reality, really. And so the Buddha talked about four things that he called perversions, or distortions, there's perversions to uh, charge to the word. Uh, and the first one is of, um, beauty. Beauty is a perversion. The second one is happiness. Happiness is a perversion. Or as a perversion. I'll explain what I mean by this. The third one is permanence. Permanence is a perversion. And the fourth one is self. So perversion isn't the right word. Distortion, right? If I say distortion, it makes a little more sense. Something that is not beautiful if you, if you have a distorted view, you might see it as beautiful. That might be hard to see, but it, when you practice meditation, you get it, right? And, and what's neat is these line up 
quite well with the four foundations of mindfulness, and the commentary points this out, which I think is helpful. When the Buddha talked about perversion of beauty, it lines up quite well with mindfulness of the body. There are other things we find beautiful, but the body is a really good example of something we find beautiful, and a really good example of something that we really shouldn't find beautiful. Because it's pretty glaringly obvious that the body is not really a beautiful thing. And in fact, we're so messed up, kind of, that we at once find it grotesque and beautiful at the same time. Right? We say, oh, the body is so beautiful. But give it a few days. <laughs> Don't do anything to it. You know? How beautiful is your body after not scrubbing away at it and decking it up nicely and caring for it meticulously. The body, the Buddha said, is like a bag, a sack, with a sack full of putrid, oozing refuse with nine holes. The body has nine holes in it. And it's oozing from these nine holes. One monk I said, one, one monk I heard, the, the teacher, he, he said, he suggested to us that we're like a walking toilet, a walking porta potty or something, full of urine and feces. Because we walk around, it sloshes out sometimes, oozes out. Now, we're not meant in this practice, to see the body as something grotesque. But it is kind of perverse that we are so, like go around someone who has bad body odor, right? It just nauseates you. It shouldn't, but it does. Why? Because you like the good smell. Not the body smell, but the smell of the body covered in perfume or shampoo or whatever. Why we have kiwi shampoo and so on. I want to smell like kiwis because their body smells very, very bad. Let your hair go for a while, it gets greasy and flaky. And our teeth start to rot, and our teeth smell really bad, our mouths smell really bad, right? Mindfulness of the body helps to bring some sort of, well, sobriety where we're intoxicated. So it sobers us up about the body. One of the great benefits of mindfulness is this, that when you're mindful of the body and just experience in general, you start to lose this distorted view of things as being beautiful or ugly, attractive, repulsive. You're no longer buffeted, right? You're no longer like this pumpkin on the water, floating around, drifting, whatever, buffeted by whatever wind is pushing you. It's such a relief when the body is just the body, when you free yourself from it. And as you guessed, well, maybe the second distortion fits in nicely with the second foundation of mindfulness. The second distortion is the distortion of happiness. So specifically seeing things that are not happiness as happiness. Or it might be easier to understand as not satisfying as satisfying, because that's the reason why we say they're not happiness. It's not that certain experiences are pleasurable. pleasurable. It's that even pleasure can't satisfy us and doesn't actually make us happier. So if you think of it like that, like having experienced all this pleasure in my life, am I a happier person for it? The answer is most definitely no. You're a more stressed person, a more anxious person, a more unpleasant and unhappy person. So when we're mindful of Vedana, mindful of pleasure, mindful of pain, mindful of calm even, 
We're able to see the uncertainty of it and the meaninglessness of it. The pleasure doesn't actually help us, but what really doesn't help us is liking the pleasure, liking the calm. When we like good things, that doesn't make us happier. It makes us more dependent. It cultivates addiction, attachment, and suffering. The third distortion is the distortion of permanence. And this fits nicely with mindfulness of the mind because the mind is, it's the least permanent thing about us, and yet it's the thing that we think of as permanent, right? Okay, the body, yeah, this isn't the same body, but surely this is the same mind. I was born with this mind, I'm gonna die with this mind. That's what we think. And that's a distortion, that's, that's perverse. <laughs> it's perverse because it's wrong. It's not right, it's not the truth. It's a distorted view. The truth is that mind is, is a experience that arises and ceases. And through the practice of mindfulness of the mind, you'll see that, right? Thinking about this, thinking about the future one moment, thinking about the past the next, focused one moment, distracted the next moment. On, on one track of mind, and then suddenly, boom, something else comes up. You think, but I was thinking about that. What are you, where are you taking me? You start to realize that there is no lasting thing. Mind is something unpredictable and impermanent. And then you see it arising and ceasing. And the fourth distortion fits with the fourth satipatthana, mindfulness of the Dhamma. So the Dhamma is a little bit complex because there's a lot of things in it. But one really good way that this addresses the distortion of self is in regards to the hindrances and by extension really all of our mind states because we think of ourselves as being angry we think of ourselves as wanting things our worries our, our doubts our emotions in general are very much a part of our identity and furthermore they cloud us they prevent us from seeing reality So it's the biggest blow to our ego, really, to see the emotions as, as arising and ceasing, to have a new perspective on them, that these things that we call our personality, right, our emotions, our, our qualities of mind, are also not under our control. That's what we think of the self, right? What makes me different from you? Well, I'm smarter than you. I'm more funny than you, more clever, you know? What makes me different? I have an anger problem. I have an addiction problem. I have uh, anxiety disorder. I have depression. That's what makes me me. That's who I am. But it's not. And these things are not. They don't define us. In fact, they teach us that there is really no us, per se. Us is just an idea that comes what there is, is experiences and reactions to those experiences. So when we focus on these emotions, we start to see, oh yes, these things are not me. They're not under my control for sure. They're unwieldy, unmanageable. This helps us overcome the distortion of self, that things are, are ours, belong to us. And it's a distortion because of what it does, what it does, the result. And the result is stress and suffering. And things are not that way. When, when we try to control our anger, try to control our greed and our attachment, we cling to our depression and anxiety and feel like we can't get rid of this thing that belongs to us. Once we see that it doesn't belong to us, this new perspective allows us to be free from it. 
Anxiety doesn't have to cause a reaction. Anger doesn't have to cause a reaction. They are just uh, emotions that come and go. So those are the four perversions. A really good uh, answer to, as to why the four foundations of mindfulness provide some perspective on what we're practicing. And, you know, anything, any, any talk about the four foundations of mindfulness is good because it's reminding you of these things. These are happening to you right here and now. But no matter how much I talk, it's no substitute for actual practice. So that's all I have to say for today. I wish you all good practice and we'll see you all tomorrow.